Good morning. It's good to see you all. It's good to be here with you all on this uh, Sunday, the third Sunday of this season of Lent, where we journey our way towards Holy Week and the final events of Jesus' life. Warm welcome if you're here worshiping with us in person or if you're worshiping with us via the live stream today. We're glad that you're joining us in whatever way. Um, we're through the season of Lent focusing on some of the parables of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. In particular, some of the parables Jesus tells in that final uh, week of his life, the final days of his life. And that leads us today to a parable about a great wedding banquet and a bunch of really bad guests. Um, so we'll come to that parable in a little bit, and that'll shape some of our worship together today. But a warm welcome. We're, uh, it's good to be here together. It's good to worship together. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 19, and I invite you to rise as able. And here, as God's word calls us from Psalm 19, Bruce will lead us in that. God's word calls us to worship him today from Psalm 19, which reflects on the revelation of God in creation and in scripture, moving us to know and seek God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statute of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. But who can discern his own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. May these words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 19 leads us in a spirit of recognizing the grandeur of God's works, turning to some self-examination and celebrating the Lord who is our rock and redeemer. And it's that God who welcomes us to this time of worship. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the abundant fellowship of the Holy Spirit all be with you. Amen and amen. Come, let's worship God together in song.
We've just sung that we are frail children of dust, and that is a good uh, line to bring us into the next part of our service, which is a time of confession and lament, drawing today especially from this prayer from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. We join that psalmist prayer with our song singing, I will wait for you. psalmist prayer, we lament both the evil in the world and we confess the evil that is in us. Please join where indicated in this prayer. Out of the depths, Lord, out of the depths, we turn to you in prayer this day. We pray from the depths of our sin and sadness, for we acknowledge that we are fallen people living in a broken world. Our hearts do not love you or our neighbor as we should. Our minds do not grasp and love truth as they should. Our lives do not reflect your faithfulness and goodness. Our homes, neighborhoods, cities, and nations do not embody your peace. And so we pray, how long, O oh Lord? How long must the poor and the powerless be denied justice? How long must the abused and the oppressed be misused? How long must the wicked prosper? How long must the nations rage in war and violence? O oh Lord, hear our cry from out of the depths for forgiveness, for mercy, and for the making new of all things. Oh God, when we realize the depth of our sin, we are driven into dark despair. It is only when we realize the height of your mercy and the breadth of your forgiveness that we begin to see the dawning of new life in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We continue in song.
And then here also, as the psalmist in the closing verses of that psalm points us to good news and great hope, this word of assurance and hope. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. We're going to continue uh, in prayer for the needs of the church and the world. Just a couple of notes as we prepare to do so. Um, most of you will probably by now have read that Lois Veldkamp, um, after some days of hospitalization, trouble with uh, breathing and heart rate, um, she had a pacemaker installed um, on Wednesday, and she came home uh, later on Thursday, and I saw her on Friday, and she was uh, feeling, she said, as well as she has in years so we can give thanks for effective treatment there, and she is healing well at home. Um, I want to pray also, um, Ruth Wieringa mentioned to me this morning, reminded me of something I'd seen and heard, which was um, an accident that happened in, um, I'm not sure what nation, but in Africa somewhere with a group of uh, YWAM, Youth with a Mission group, where 11 were killed in a bus accident. Uh, so we want to pray for the families and, and that organization as well. We're going to pray today um, in line with the, the Lord's Prayer as it's unfolded and, and uh, exemplified in the teaching of the Heidelberg Catechism. So using some of those words to guide our prayer, let's go to God together and let's pray. O oh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name, Father. Help us to today really know you, to bless, worship, and praise you for all your works and for all that shines forth from your works, of your almighty power, your wisdom, your kindness, your justice, your mercy, and your truth. Help us to direct all our living, what we think, what we say, what we do, so that your name will never be disrespected or blasphemed because of us, but because of our lives, your name might be honored and praised. Father, may your kingdom come. We pray that you would rule us by your word and your spirit. And do this in such a way that more and more we find it a delight to submit our lives to you. We ask you to keep your church strong. We ask you to add to your church. We pray that your church all around the globe as well as here locally would be strong and growing. 
So we pray in that spirit for the, the work and ministry of our own congregation. Coordinate our ministry with that of the other congregations in our neighborhood and city so that together we might bear a vibrant witness to you. We pray for all the ministries of our church, for the offerings we take this day, the, the regular work done by staff and volunteers and committees and council. We pray for our ongoing uh, efforts to partner with East Village Preschool. We pray that you would bless the, the preparations and arrangements for that. We pray for the Christian Agape Church and thank you for the partnership we, by which we share this place with them and occasionally share more of food and worship and life together. Oh God, we pray that you would destroy the devil's work. Destroy every force that revolts against you and every conspiracy against your word. We pray that you destroy the devil's work of sowing discord and violence and despair throughout the world and sometimes in the church too. We pray that for an end to violence in places of war, noting that this week marks two years of war in Ukraine, knowing that so many lives, so many uh, communities have been just devastated by this war. O oh God who avenges, stay the aggressor's hand and defend, we pray, the innocent and show mercy to that troubled land and those hurting people. May your will be done on earth as in heaven, Father. Help us and help all people to reject what is our own will and our own agenda and to obey your will without resistance or evasion. Your will alone is what is good. Help us to love what is good and help us to carry out all the good work that you have called us to do and help us to do that as willingly and as faithfully and as joyfully as the angels in heaven. Father, give us this day our daily bread. We ask that you take care of all of our physical needs, food, shelter, health, and strength. We pray for those in our community who have troubled needs medically at present. We pray your continued care for Mary Jane Van Loo, for Craig Vandervlees, and for Carol Kuypers, and for others who are in need of healing and strength, recuperation, O oh, great physician, tend them closely and carefully. We give thanks for Lois Veldkamp's uh, effective treatment this week and pray that it would bear good fruit for her in health and strength uh, for many weeks, months, and years to come. O oh God, take care of all these physical needs in ways that grow our trust in you as the only source of every good thing so that we do not receive physical blessings and benefits without the true blessing and benefit of walking in communion with you. Forgive us our debts, Father, as we also forgive our debtors. We only dare to pray this because of Christ's blood shed for us. Don't hold against us, poor sinners that we are, any of the sins we commit or the evil that constantly clings to us or we find ourselves attached to and immersed in. Forgive us, we pray, just as we are fully determined as evidence of your grace in us to forgive our neighbors. Lead us not into temptation, Father, but deliver us from the evil one. We acknowledge that on our own we're too weak to stand against the assaults of the evil one, against the assaults of the devil, the world, and even our own flesh. So, Lord, uphold us and make us strong with the strength of your own Holy Spirit dwelling within us guiding us so that we don't go down to defeat in these spiritual struggles, but stand firm until finally we win the complete victory. For yours, Father, is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We make all these requests of you because you're all powerful, but because you're also deeply good. And you've shown this to us in the person of Jesus. It's through him that we acknowledge you're worthy of receiving all the praise forever and ever. And it's in him that we are confident that you hear and receive our prayers. And so we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have gathered in God's grace. We now turn to growing in God's truth. And as we prepare to open God's word together, we're going to sing the song that prepares us to receive it, praying today, Lord, order our steps in your word. I invite you to rise as able as we sing together.
Our reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, and I'd invite you to turn there with me in a pew Bible or whatever you have on hand, your own Bible device, to turn to Matthew 22. If you're turning in the pew Bible, it's on page 803, 803. This is the third of a kind of a set of three parables that Jesus tells, and we've looked at the previous two, and now we'll look at this third and in some ways climactic of the three. Hear the word of the Lord from Matthew 22. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I came across a quote from Benjamin Franklin about guests. Maybe you've heard it. Guests like fish begin to smell after three days. And this quote from Confucius, every house guest brings you happiness. Some, when they arrive, and some when they are leaving. I really wonder if that's genuinely from Confucius. I don't know, the internet. It does make me wonder, though, if it is. I mean, were Confucius and Ben Franklin especially good hosts? Would you really want to stay with them more than three days? Uh, There are lots of um, things out there about how to be a good host and how to be a good guest. Uh, But it seems to me what we have in Jesus' parable is something about how to be a bad guest. Um, I looked at, there are these um, different, um, you know, etiquette guides that are out there. And I came across one. Uh, about the worst types of guests. And this was written, I think, especially for maybe like the hospitality industry, but I think you'll see it applies to other settings. Let me just give you some of them. It says, here are the worst types of guests. Uh, One kind is the complainer. These are guests who find fault in everything and are vocal about their dissatisfaction. And the demanding, those who have exceedingly high expectations and The light is green and the sound is on. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Where were we? Oh, yeah, the complainer, the demanding. 
Um, also, the impatient. The impatient who are constantly in a hurry. They dislike waiting for everything. They expect immediate attention. You can see how some of these might overlap at times. There is the boundary pusher. Those who cross personal or ethical boundaries with their host. They make unwanted advances, improper comments. There are uh, the loud the loud, the noisy, the disruptive, who may disturb other guests, and, I, and at times that will overlap with another care, uh, type, the, uh, the inebriated, those who consume too much alcohol and become loud and unruly and disruptive to other guests. There are more, but you get the idea, I think. There are all these different ways of be, types of being bad guests. And the site, um, this, the one I, the article I read on this, gave a lot of advice for how to handle all these types of bad guests. And I can summarize a lot of it in a few words. It's politely but firmly. Politely but firmly. And what strikes me as I was thinking about that and thinking about, you know, the expectation around hosts and guests in different settings and different cultures. Like, I suppose every culture has to have some expectations around what it is to be a good guest and what it is to be a good Host. And a lot of it, I suspect, just reflects what it is to be a decent person. Something about being a guest or a host kind of reveals your character and maybe shapes it in some ways. Some people, when they're a guest, they just, it's like they can't help themselves, but the, the loud, uh, demanding person just comes out of them. Uh, when they're in a hotel room, they just can't help themselves, but to help themselves to everything. And the towels get packed up in the suitcase as they go, and the room is left, you know, a mess. Something about being a guest can bring out the best in you, or it can bring out the, the worst in you. And I suspect, as much as those lists and rules reveal something about human nature and culture, I think what Jesus' parable does is says all of that also reveals something on a, a yet broader, deeper level, so a level that's cosmic and eternal in its significance because part of what Jesus has come to do is to say you know the kingdom of heaven is at hand in Jesus arrival this is his constant message the kingdom of heaven is at hand and how you respond to that corresponds to how you might receive an invitation to the greatest banquet and there are ways to be a a good guest, but Jesus' parable maybe helpfully points at all, all the ways, or at least many of the ways in which you can be a really bad guest at the greatest banquet of them all. That's where I want to start. We're talking, before talking about the bad guests is to talk about just what they're invited to in this, in this um, teaching of Jesus. We've uh, mentioned that these are parables Jesus tells in the final week of his life, probably Tuesday of Holy Week, is when he's having this uh, increasing, intensifying um, time of argument and conflict with especially the religious leaders of the day, right? The Pharisees and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they are in debate with Jesus, and he is telling these parables in various ways that are confrontational. Um, we notice in verse 46 of the previous chapter, just before what we read, after the last parable, it says they were looking for a way to arrest Jesus. That tells you how much these are not innocuous little stories Jesus are telling. They see them, they are transparent enough that they realize something of what Jesus is up to, and they're ready to arrest him for it. Arrest the storyteller, because these stories are getting out of hand. There is something in the, the three, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, there's something of, uh, uh, I think, a growth in these parables. The first one, back in um, chapter 21 at verse 28, was about a man with two sons who had a vineyard. The second one was about, um, that we looked at last week, is about, in verse 33 there, there was a landowner. And the term there is a quite specific one. It's oikodespotes, the, the ruler the master of the household and of the estate. So it went from a guy with a couple of sons to the master and ruler of an estate. And now we've intensified it a step further, and now we're telling a story about a king. Nothing less than a king. 
which at the end of the previous parable, Jesus had mentioned something about the kingdom. The kingdom will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit in verse 43. And it's like now the, the focus becomes exactly that, a king and a kingdom. It is, in verse 2, Jesus says, a parable that is about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Now, uh, in the first two, there was the father hoping his two sons would go out and be faithful workers. In the second one, it was uh, the master of this vineyard looking for faithful work in his vineyard. And now, it's someone who's not looking for workers, but looking for guests. Looking for guests at a great, great banquet, the wedding of the son. The wedding of the king's son, the wedding of a prince, would be an occasion for incredible broad, vast, communal celebration, right, across the whole kingdom. There are, in this parable, extensive preparations made and invitations go out as they would go out first to all the, the nobility of the land, the high-ranking officials would all receive this invitation well, well in advance, telling them to prepare and to get ready for the wedding of the king because soon the banquet will be ready and you'll be told to come. It, it strikes me, I mean, we're, we're pretty far removed from the, the world and realm of royalty. We get little snippets of it, though. When over, you know, across the pond, they have a royal wedding, the ratings on TV of Americans who do not want a king but can't resist the allure of a royal wedding, the ratings are through the roof. A royal wedding is a sign of uh, hope, uh, for a whole people, for a kingdom being renewed and being passed on to a new generation, the wedding of the king is, is a time for all involved to celebrate. And Jesus' parable puts the question, what if the royal wedding weren't just something you could watch on TV, but you were given a personal invitation to be at the wedding? You were given an invitation to have a seat at the table of this magnificent banquet the greatest meal you'd ever eat in your whole life this extraordinary event with marvelous and, and impressive people with food and drink that blows you away and you receive the invitation to the greatest banquet of your life and how will you respond to it it is the wedding of the king's son how will you respond to it and Jesus makes it very clear, this is not just a story, a parable. This is about the kingdom of heaven. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It is like a king throwing a banquet for his son on his wedding day. And what happens when the invitations go out? Well, that's where we get to the real focus of most of the parable. How to be a bad guest at the greatest banquet of them all. How to be a bad guest. So following a little bit that etiquette guide that I, I uh, alluded to earlier, I want to give you um, five. Five ways in Jesus' parable to be a really bad guest when it comes to the greatest banquet of them all. The first one, uh, my icons aren't quite as good as the ones that came from that article, but I tried my best, okay? I probably should have pulled Phil in on this and they would have been better, but this is what I got. So, uh, the, the first category of bad guest is the indifferent. It's there in verse 3. He sent his servants to those who had been invited. So there's a previous invitation, a kind of save the date invi type invitation that goes out first. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused. Now literally the translation is they were not willing. They were not willing. They did not will it. They did not desire to come, or as another translation put it, they were indifferent. They just didn't have a lot of appetite or interest in attending the thing. Now, um, this is more than getting a, you know, a wedding invitation for somebody's kid that you barely know, and it's a Saturday afternoon in the summer, and there's only so many of those, and they're so lovely, and you barely know the couple, and you're going to have to go get a gift, and so you think, ah, Hmm, maybe not. This is, like I said, this is an invitation to the royal wedding of the king's son. This is 
far greater than that. This is one of the greatest events that will happen in a lifetime. And these, that's where the, the surprise, the first surprise in this parable comes. Who could be indifferent to that? They, they have no desire. They have no appetite. They have no interest. Maybe you've heard this quote from um, C.S. Lewis before. Preachers like to use it. I've probably used it before. But he talks this about, he says this about our desire for the, the things of God. Remember, this is a parable about the kingdom of heaven. And Lewis says, it would seem that our Lord, Jesus, finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because the child cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. I mean, it's a, just a moment in the, in the parable itself, but it strikes me as a, a description of so much of a spiritual condition, maybe especially in a fast-paced, modern, contemporary world and in living in a place of significant abundance and relative peace and calm, to say, who has an appetite for the kingdom of heaven? Who even in that context recognizes the invitation to the banquet of the kingdom of heaven as something not to be missed for the world? Who has appetite and desire for the things of God? Well, that's the first category, the just indifferent. They sort of brush it off. They blow it off. Secondly, there are the, the distracted. This is in verse 5. When he sends additional servants who say, hey, everything's ready, the, uh, the oxen and the fattened cow, cattle have been butchered, everything is ready, the banquet is ready, so now come, and it says in verse 5, but they paid no attention, and they went off, one to his field, another to his business. To the field, to the business. It's closely related, of course, to the indifferent. They're indifferent maybe because they're distracted, or maybe the indifference grows into distraction. They're distracted by the things of life and the world, even their own otherwise very good things. As Jesus names it here, to his field, to his business, it seems to be the things of work and com commerce and business that, that pull them away and cause them to miss out to the, the yet greater opportunity that's before them. They miss the banquet because they are so focused on buying and selling and raising crops probably so that they can have, you know, things to eat, which is, of course, what the banquet is offering them. They miss out on the banquet because they're, they miss out on the real bread because they're so worried about their daily bread. They miss what's freely given all the while, ironically, trying to earn it and chase after it. Well, that too, the distraction to the other things is a description of humankind, no doubt. But then the, the parable uh, intensifies yet a step further. It goes from the distracted to the violent. Verse 6, the rest, so some went off to the field of the business, but the rest seized the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. We're saying these are different categories of bad guests, but these are really, really bad guests. <laughs> It, it carries over something from the previous parable where servants are sent and, and mistreated and abused. It's, it's clearly, again, retelling something of the, the history of Israel with the prophets and messengers of God. Within the parable itself, it seems clear. These are, this is an invitation from the king, and these would be nobles, powerful people who do not want this person as their king. It would be... Um, they are looking for an opportunity to cause offense and pick a fight and rebel against the lordship of the king. And they take the opportunity of the royal wedding as their, as their chance. It's like they've been waiting for an opportunity. Something about the widespread dishonoring of the king and indifference and distraction sort of emboldens them to go a step further and, and forcibly resist mistreating, beating, and killing the servants. If, if there is something like a progression here, and it seems to me like there might be, that, that when it comes to the kingdom of heaven as human beings, we can start with kind of indifference. Eh, eh, whatever. 
But our indifference may very well grow into distraction. Since we're not interested in that, we get interested in other things. And the other things really do come to animate us and, and center our lives. And then a step further. So then when the, the pressing invitation to the kingdom of heaven comes... Well, now it's really disruptive, and it's something we want to resist uh, with determination. We've grown from indifference through distraction to blatant defiance. Uh, the, the parables previous to the two previous parables, and, and really up to this point in this one, seem to um, be describing human nature, but especially as it has played itself out in the history of Israel up to the time of Jesus. Right, it's kind of a, a recap and summary. God is this uh, father with the two sons. God is the vineyard owner of the, the vineyard that is Israel. God is the king over the kingdom that is Israel. And in each case, uh, seeking something from his people of, of faithfulness and loyalty. But again, facing resistance again and again and again. Just as John the Baptist was resisted. Just as Jesus now is facing resistance. This is part of a, a long track record. But especially um, moving from here forward in the parable, it seems to be about more from the time of Jesus and pulling towards the future. The next category is the bad guests who are just bad. Some guests are just bad. When, when there's all this resistance, the king is enraged, and, and he says to his uh, servants in verse 8, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come, so go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. And in verse 10, so the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is a, a sort of surprising little inclusion in Jesus' parable. Some do come to this banquet, um, but they aren't all necessarily model guests. The message is, bring in whoever you can find. Just get them in. Fill up the banquet hall. It doesn't matter if they're good, bad, or ugly. Get them in. This banquet needs some guests. The honor of the sun is at stake. And among those who are ushered in are the bad. And the, the term there is, is uh, basically the, the morally corrupt, the, the, the wicked the evil. These are wicked, evil people. They're not necessarily better than those guests who resisted before, but they're at least willing to go along for the ride. Maybe they at least want a, a free meal. They are not just, they are bad guests in that they are just guests who are bad people. But in the gracious gathering of this king, being bad in itself is not a grounds for exclusion. This reminds us a little bit maybe of the parable Jesus told about the, the wheat and the tares, that the, the field of that, that uh, master of the, the field is, was mixed. It was mixed with the, the good seed growing good plants and the bad seed growing um, bad, poisonous plants. And now, too, this banquet hall is filled, but it's not to say everyone there is necessarily a, a great person. I mean, it's a lovely inclusion, I think, in this parable, in a way, because it signifies to us something about the message of the kingdom that Jesus has come to proclaim. And the invitation that he is giving really is very, very broad. It is open to anyone, to the, those who think themselves righteous and to those who know themselves not to be, calling them to come on in. It's a picture within this parable of what Jesus did in his ministry, which was to so often hang out with those who were, well, the morally corrupt and the wicked prostitutes and the tax collectors, those who had blown it in life and everybody knew it. It's a little picture of salvation by grace. Jesus Christ came to bring the kingdom, to die for the ungodly. While we were still enemies with God, Christ died for us. So it's a really, I mean, it's a small little moment in the parable, but it's really, a, in the broader sense of the gospel, a huge concept. It's really a beautiful note that the bad are in, in the wedding banquet. But it does raise the question that comes up in the, the last kind of bad guest. The one who's rudely dressed. So verse 11 and 12, when the king came in to see the guests, 
he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And the man was speechless. This is a very confusing moment in this parable, I think, for most of us when we read it. It sounds uh, incredibly unfair and rude of the king. You invite all these people in, and then because one fellow doesn't have the right kind of jacket or tie, you're just going to, well, tie him up hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth? Where it's good to remember that it's a parable, and there's some metaphor going on here. Um, one cultural thing that's probably pretty important here. It seems that most of the commentators agree culturally. At a king, at a royal wedding, you would be provided as a gift with clothing to wear. It would come as you came in, like a wedding favor. You would receive, a, you know, some kind of a, a tunic, a garment that would signify you as a guest, just like a, a bride and groom are likely to, you know, sometimes pay for the tuxedo or dress that their wedding party well here everybody is the wedding party and everybody receives a gift of clothing to wear for the wedding so that that may help us understand it a bit this is someone who has refused what is given and yet still wants to be in on the feast in the broader teaching of matthew's gospel the emphasis seems like it, it becomes more clear. Accepting Jesus' invitation to the kingdom means conversion to Christ, turning our lives over to him. And it brings, in this sense, a, a change of clothing. A new righteousness is given to us to wear. And we put on the clothing of Christ as we trust and obey him. And we begin, at least, to live a life of faithfulness and love that resembles something of the life of Jesus. So Jesus' inclusion of this here in the parable seems to come mainly as a word of caution. Don't, by any means, mistake the, the broad warmth of the gracious invitation to come in to the, the banquet as some kind of excuse for your own moral and spiritual sloppiness. Don't misuse, don't take advantage of the graciousness of the invitation to avoid living a life of loving obedience to Jesus. And that's where the word of warning comes in because if, if you miss that, then the, the consequence, as Jesus teaches elsewhere, is to be thrown out. You are to wear the righteousness of Jesus in faith and trust and in obedience. And that is how you come to really belong at his banqueting table. This is a great parable. <laughs> it includes a lot. It says a lot in the short story, as Jesus so often does. It's a great story about a great banquet and mostly very bad guests. But there are a number of good guests who do come because it's a good host who gives a great invitation. And there are many who come, the bad and the good, but do put on the wedding clothes and find their seat at the table and celebrate the wedding feast of the royal son. Jesus' parable, remember that he's teaching this in some of the closing days of his life. And there's this growing intensification, it seems like, of the message of don't, don't miss out on what God is doing in and through his son. He is providing a banquet, the banquet of the kingdom. And you can miss out on it now, and you can, you can miss out on it now in the sense that you can miss out on having a life of trusting and resting in Jesus and living transformed by his grace and truth. You can miss that and miss out on so much now there's also the possibility that you'll miss it out the final glory then. The invitation is coming already now, but one day the, the wedding banquet itself will really come. In the book of Revelation, of course, it's referred to as the wedding supper of the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain. That Jesus is, um, in the days after telling this parable, going to be arrested and tortured and uh, have a, a, a sham of a trial and falsely accused and convicted and he's going, to be, he's going to be put to death on a cross to suffer for the sins of the world, the, the bad, 
the evil, the wicked, the rebellious, those who've resisted the message, and those who have shamed God's messengers, including Jesus himself, the final and greatest messenger and servant and son of them all. And yet as he goes to the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they are doing. And he will suffer and endure all this in order to extend the invitation to any and all to really prepare this great wedding banquet. And the, the missing character, of course, in this whole parable is well, who is the son marrying? Who's the bride? And the bride, in the broader New Testament sense, becomes clearer and clearer. It is the church. Jesus intends to have us at his banquet, not merely as guests sitting at, you know, in the back table, but at the head table, seated with him as the bride of Christ. That is the role and place of the church, beginning now, but ultimately then. That is the invitation. It's an even greater invitation than come eat a bite of food. It's come and join your lives in loving communion and fellowship to Jesus who lays his life on the line for his bride, the church. It's a beautiful story. It's a powerful parable. But what it points to is so far greater than how do you be a good guest or a bad guest or a good host or a bad host, but will we come to Jesus? Will we come to Jesus in repentance and love and trust and joy that shapes our lives starting now but unto eternity? That we become not only his guests but his bride. To that end, let's join our hearts and turn to Christ Jesus in prayer. Jesus, we recognize you as the storyteller of this parable today. But we recognize you even more as the one who lives out and fulfills it to the nth degree through your life, through your suffering, through your death, through your resurrection and your ascension on high, and this ongoing call, come, come to this wedding banquet. Come to the wedding banquet. Oh God, we, we are humbled to hear today that warm, strong, gracious invitation. We hear the warning in it, don't miss out on this for the world, but we especially hear and receive this gracious invitation. And Lord, if there are any among us who have not really turned our lives over to Jesus, who have not really come to him in, in humble love and trust, then let that happen in us. This week, this day, this hour, maybe even in this moment, that we would, for the first time or the hundredth time, but truly and sincerely, come to you. Say, yes. Yes, I acknowledge that I have no way to deserve belonging at this banquet, but you have graciously invited me and I will come. I will come. I wouldn't miss it for anything. And so, Lord, we bring our lives to you in love and trust. Receive, receive us, receive our prayer, receive our thanks and our praise, all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing. To sing our response, I invite you to rise as able as we join in song together.
Beautiful words, beautifully sung. Amazing love, amazing love. Can it truly be that this love is for us, that the invitation to this communion with Christ and this eternal banquet is truly ours? We believe in Christ Jesus, it is true. Um, if you would have something on your heart, whether that message itself or something else that you'd like a chance to pray with someone about, I'd encourage you, we have an elder who's available at the prayer room after the service. Likewise, if you're worshiping with us, on the live stream, there's opportunity there to contact us. We'd love to hear from you, speak with one of our elders or myself. i uh, be happy to talk with you, pray with you. But as we close our worship, just hear again that great, great call in Jesus' parable and embodied by his whole life. Come, come to the wedding banquet. Do not miss the feast of the wedding of the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain for us and for our salvation and receive his word of blessing. And Lord, bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you now and forevermore his abiding peace. Amen and amen.